What a beautiful song. Amen, church. Amen. Praise the Lord. Uh, my name is Andy McDonald. If we haven't had the opportunity to meet, I was here. It's been a month or so or a couple of months ago, and, uh, and it was my pleasure to be here then, and it's my pleasure to be back with you. Uh, I'm the guy who's really good friends with a guy named Steve Rice. I'm looking to read some faces to see if that's a good thing or not. No, he's a good friend, and I know beloved by this church. In fact, he and Laura just celebrated 33 years of marriage, and uh, our offices are right next door to each other, so uh, we tend to stay in trouble over there at the Kentucky Baptist Convention building. Uh, thank you uh, again for supporting the Kentucky Baptist Convention. Uh, we are your missionaries. I know Mix, Nick Sandifer is here uh, regularly with you all. We, we're your servant missionaries, and we're uh, we're so uh, excited to be that for uh, the convention, and we thank you so much for your uh, generous giving that helps us to be, to be your uh, missionary servants in the field. Uh, well, uh, somebody might ask this question this time of year. Uh, are you ready? And uh, when somebody asks th that question this time of year, we know what they mean, don't we? Are you ready? Uh, they mean, has every gift been bought? Now, if you're like me, the answer would be no. Um, I have this wonderful wife who does the lion's share of the gift buying in our home, and I'm so grateful for her, but I'm still responsible for a few of them, and I always struggle with just those few gifts that I'm responsible for. Uh, for others, when, when we ask the question, are you ready, that may mean decorations, uh, those kinds of things. I don't know how your family tradition works. Maybe you've got all of that done. The house is already decorated. Uh, or uh, maybe there's still some things to do uh, related to preparing your house uh, for Christmas Day. Uh, there's lots of things that could potentially go into asking the question, are you ready? And for most of us, when we think about Christmas, uh, it's a time uh, of, of joy. It's a time where maybe we're looking forward to some family members coming to our home, uh, maybe folks that we haven't seen in a while or all year long, and, and, and for, for the first time this year, we'll get to see those people. Now, that's not always a good thing, is it? Because some of us have those relatives that we can only tolerate for about a day, uh, and then we're, we love them, but we're glad to see them go as well. Um, so, so, but for most of us, the, the Christmas uh, season is a, a joyful time, but for a lot of folks, uh, when we say things like, are you ready? When we, when we bring up Christmas, uh, it's something uh, that for them is to be endured. For a lot of people, Christmas is something that they just hope to get through. Just make it through uh, one more Christmas season. For a lot of people at this time of year, a lot of those old wounds, just sort of like clockwork, resurface uh, during Christmas time, maybe family wounds, maybe relational, other kinds of relational wounds, but, but for them, when Christmas rolls around, it's like, i got to deal with that again. Uh, for other people, it's the unrealistic expectations uh, that they have for Christmas. Uh, this is supposed to be a magical time, right? Uh, where everybody gets along and uh, where people smile and, and seem to be a little bit more warm and, and more kind this time of year. But then the expectation is dashed often by the reality that um, not everybody is more kind this time of year or more warm or welcoming. Uh, in fact, some people are just the opposite. They get mean. Did anybody go out on Black Friday? Uh, I went out later in the day with my wife. Uh, it sounds like everybody pretty much behaved where she went, but uh, that can be a crazy time, right? Uh, I'm going to get a gift, and I'm going to beat someone on the head to get it. Merry Christmas. <laughs> so we have these unrealistic expectations, and then a lot of folks at Christmas time, they have an emotional letdown. Uh, they think, I should be experiencing certain feelings, right? this time of year. Isn't that what the songs say? Isn't that what uh, the television shows that we watch? Isn't that what they all say? I'm supposed to have this certain really good, uh, warm, fuzzy feeling this time of year. And sometimes that feeling just doesn't come. For other people, they, 
they think about their family and, and the gathering of their family. And, and again, for most of us, that's, that would be a joyous thing. But for a lot of folks, it's like, I just hope we can get through this. Will my family get along this year? Even that crazy uncle or aunt, uh, will they behave themselves this year? For some people, Christmas is a time where depression comes into their life, maybe like no other time of the year. And we know that even, uh, sadly, tragically, suicide rates go up during Christmas time. And I think it's all tied into uh, the fact that uh, we live in a day where there's a lack of peace in our world, a lack of peace in our nation, a lack of peace in our communities, a lack of peace in our families. Today, we have so much. Would you agree with me? Can we say that even the person who is the least well-off in our country is far better off than most of the rest of the world? We have so much. We know so much. Uh, we can go to the internet and look up just about anything that our hearts desire and find the answer. We know so much. We're instantly connected with each other. Uh, in our home, sort of our preferred method of communicating, my wife and, and my three sons, is texting. Uh, is anybody else there? That's kind of the main mode of communication for you. Uh, what a blessing in many ways. Sometimes it feels like a curse, but most of the time it's a blessing. So, for example... Uh, during Thanksgiving uh, a week ago or so, um, my oldest son, who serves in the United States Army, is stationed at Fort Bliss in El Paso, Texas. He went with a friend to the friend's home, family home in California. And so Drew was on the West Coast at the Pacific Ocean. My middle son, Caleb, uh, he was in North Carolina. He was visiting with his girlfriend and her family. And the day before Thanksgiving, in fact, he knelt on a beach there in Wilmington, North Carolina, and asked Liz to marry him. And she said yes. And then my middle son, Will, who's, who's a junior in high school, of course, was stuck in the middle with his mom and dad in Kentucky. So I had one on the Pacific coast, one on the Atlantic coast, and one with us, and we could just text the whole time and talk and communicate. That's a blessing, isn't it, really? Now, sometimes uh, if you have a phone and uh, you use your phone as a tool at work, sometimes it can feel more like a tether, right? Like I just can't get away from the office. I'm just instantly connected to the office, and that's not always a good thing. But we're connected to one another through technology like no other time in human history. In fact, we, ha we enjoy technology today that was unimaginable even a generation ago. Unimaginable. We have the ability to be nearly anywhere on the planet within 24 hours in the world we live in today. We have all of these wonderful things, yet there is a famine of peace in our world today. A famine of peace, maybe like never before in human history. We have all of these things. We, uh, we're so wealthy in so many ways, but we live in a peace-depleted culture. Which leads a lot of people to ask this question. Is peace even possible today? Is peace even possible in our day. Well, we're going to look at the Christmas story as Luke retells, retells it in his gospel, chapter 2. Uh, we'll, we'll be starting at verse 8, but just to, to bring you up to speed, uh, most of you don't need to be brought up to speed, but uh, you know that Quirinius was the governor uh, of the region that included Israel, and he had called for a census, and uh, everybody was supposed to go back to their hometown, and so Joseph along with his betrothed, Mary. Uh, when you were betrothed to somebody, it was a legal engagement. It wasn't just like what happened with Caleb and Liz. 
uh, when you were betrothed to somebody, if you wanted to break the relationship off, you had to get a divorce. And so Joseph takes Mary, and uh, they end up there in Bethlehem, his hometown. And on that amazing, wonderful, miraculous night, she gives birth to the Savior of the world, the Lord Jesus Christ. And so we pick up the story in chapter 2, beginning at verse 8. And there were shepherds living out in the fields nearby, keeping watch over their flocks at night. An angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. But the angel said to them, Do not be afraid. I bring you good news that will cause great joy for all the people. Today in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. He is the Messiah, the Lord. This will be a sign to you. You will find a baby wrapped in cloths and lying in a manger. Suddenly, a great company of heavenly hosts appeared with the angel, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace to those on whom his favor rests. Verse 15, When the angels had left them and gone into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, Let's go to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has told us about. So they hurried off, and they found Mary and Joseph and the baby who was lying in the manger, verse 17. And when they had seen him, they spread the word concerning what had been told them about this child. And all who heard it were amazed at what the shepherds said to them. But Mary treasured up all these things and pondered them in her heart. The shepherds returned glorifying and praising God for all the things they had heard and seen, which were just as they had been Told. Let's, let's pray together. Lord, as we uh, look at this powerful passage in your word, Lord, we pray that uh, even though many of us have heard it many, many times, Lord, that you might give us fresh eyes to see uh, what you know we need to see this morning. And then, Lord, give us a, a renewed courage, Father, uh, to act upon what you tell us through your living and active word, the very word of God. And we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So uh, the Christ child has been born. Uh, God, Emmanuel, God with us, has broken into time and space and become one of us. And so uh, angel, an angel comes to shepherds who are there just outside of Bethlehem in those, in those rolling hills keeping watch over their flocks at night. I often wonder why uh, the, the, the Lord sent uh, the angel to shepherds, uh, people who were very often sort of looked down on in their culture. Uh, you couldn't get much lower in terms of your economic uh, and your vocational status uh, than to be a shepherd. I often wondered, why didn't God send the angel to Caesar in Rome, or at least to Quirinius or to Herod, uh, some big shot there uh, in, in some position of power? But that's not how God works. God sent the angel to the lowly shepherds. And I think even that communicates to us that God loves everyone that God's no respecter of men, that God doesn't look at the outside like we tend to look at the outside. God's not impressed by our 401Ks. God is impressed with the heart. He looks at the heart of a man. And so I think he's communicating here that I love everybody, uh, and most especially the people that others look down. Uh, someone was telling me uh, they go to Southeast Christian and, and they said a few weeks ago that Kyle Eidelman was preaching. Uh, he said this to the people there at Southeast. He said, if you're looking down on someone because of something they've done in their lives, get out. Get out. And you know what? The people stood and cheered and clapped. And I think that's a powerful statement, isn't it? Uh, no one, in other words, no one has gone beyond the reach of and grace of God. And he sent the angels to shepherds. And, uh, and so uh, their, their night of tending sheep was suddenly interrupted by this supernatural uh, presence, this angel of God. And, and he was shining in, in the glory of God 
And, and the Bible says that their first emotional response was what? Fear. Uh, in fact, they were terrified, our, our translation says. They were terrified. Uh, you might feel that way as well. I think I would as well. Um, I don't know if I've ever seen an angel. Uh, the Bible says that sometimes we may be entertaining angels unaware. Uh, it's possible that an angel could slip into one of our worship services. Amen? Uh, but generally, if that happens, they're, they're not shining out with the glory of God. So we may have seen one and not known it. But this angel came in all the glory of God. And they were afraid. They'd never seen anything like that. But the angel says to them, don't be afraid. I've got the greatest news for you. The greatest news that humanity will ever hear. God has come near. Heaven has come to earth. The long-awaited promised Messiah is here. He's been born in Bethlehem. And, uh, and so uh, when we think about Christmas and the angel's message to the shepherd, uh, I think of peace. It was a message of peace. And uh, when we think about peace, I, I think what, where we often get tripped up is that we think of peace in maybe more of a worldly understanding. Uh, but when we understand it from a biblical perspective, uh, then we can begin to walk in it and appreciate the peace that only God can bring into our lives in a special and deeper and more profound way. Uh, one of the things that's important to remember about the peace that the Bible talks about is that peace is personal. Look at the verse, one of the verses we read. Uh, Do not be afraid, the angel said to the shepherds. I bring you good news that will cause great joy for all the people. Uh, th there's at least 365 occasions where the Bible says, do not be afraid. That's one for every day of the year. Amen? Now, uh, when the Bible says something, it need, it need only say it once for us to have our attention peaked, right? And, and for us to lean in and hear and, and seek to obey. But when the Bible says something 365 times, we really better listen. Do not be afraid. I bring you. It's personal. The good news of Jesus Christ is for you and you and you and everyone here and everyone in the world. And I bring you good news that will, that will cause joy in your heart and peace, peace. I read the story of a, of a wealthy man who commissioned an artist to paint peace. And so uh, the artist uh, went off excitedly and began to paint. Uh, and his first painting was a very pastoral scene. Uh, it was a meadow and a farm and some cows and a beautiful sun in the sky and some puffy clouds and some birds and a few trees and a stream. Very pretty. And so he went back excitedly to the wealthy man and said, I painted peace for you. And the man said, no, that's not what I'm looking for. You need to try again. And so the artist went back and he thought about it for, for a little while and he came up with what he just was sure would be peace for the wealthy man. And so he painted the picture of a mama holding her baby. Can't get much more peaceful than that, can you? And so he rushes back to the wealthy man and, and just sure he's nailed it this time. And he holds it up and he says, I've painted peace for you. And the man says, no, that's not what I'm looking for. You need to go back and try it again. And so the artist goes back and, and he's frustrated and, and hurt and a little rejected uh, and just unsure of exactly what the man is looking for uh, in terms of peace. Uh, in fact, he even prayed about it. God, would you help me to know what peace would look like uh, for this man? And then he thought he'd hit on it and he began to paint feverishly. And he went back to the man's home and 
he presented him the painting and he said, I think I finally painted peace. And the man looked at it and he said, you sure did. That's exactly what I'm looking for. Now, what scene did the artist paint when he finally nailed peace for uh, the wealthy man? He painted, uh, it, was a, it was a seashore painting and there was a storm raging dark clouds. He depicted the wind blowing and, and great swells of surf crashing uh, onto the shore. And there was a great cliff there on the shore and the waves were battering uh, against that cliff. And in the middle of the picture, small but still detectable, was a little hole in the cliff with a little overhang. And inside the hole was a bird sitting on her nest safe and secure from the storm. That was the man's understanding of peace. And you know what? I think he had it right. I think that's a better picture of peace. Now, we love it when we, when we enjoy relative peace in our circumstances, in our lives. I'm not looking for trouble. Are you? Amen? But we know that life is often not like that. Uh, in fact, I think we misunderstand what the Bible says when it describes Christian peace. Listen, peace is not the absence of conflict. Peace is the absence of fear. Peace is not the absence of conflict for a Christian. Peace is the absence of fear. Uh, that's why uh, when Jesus said in Matthew 10, 34, Do not suppose that I have come to bring peace to the earth. I did not come to bring peace but a sword. That's why that's still perfectly compatible with what the angels told those shepherds about the peace of God coming to earth through the Messiah. See, the gospel brings peace to the heart of the one who believes in Jesus, not necessarily to the circumstances of the one who believes in Jesus. If we ever tell someone when we're sharing the good news with a lost person, if we ever tell them, hey, if you'll just give your life to Jesus, you can have a problem-free life, we're lying to them, aren't we? That would not be the truth. In fact, in many ways, when we choose to follow Jesus, we're going to experience some other kinds of storms that, that people in the world don't necessarily experience. Sometimes it's just downright hard to follow Jesus. But we can still have his peace. See, the kind of peace that he brings is not political. No government can secure the kind of peace that only Jesus can bring to the heart of a man or woman, boy or girl. You can't purchase it at the mall. Now, uh, my wife likes to say that when she goes shopping, she is doing retail therapy. Um, uh, she says, I, I don't even need to buy anything. I just need to look at stuff. And I'm, I'm going, well, it seems like you usually buy something, though, when you go, but that's okay, too. But for me, to go shopping is like doing time, okay? Uh, and unless I get to eat. Now, if there's lunch or dinner, in, in, then I can kind of endure it. Um, but, but you can't go to the mall or another store and say, I'll take that big screen TV and can, can you give me some peace and wrap it up in a nice bow. You can't buy it at the mall. Some people try to buy peace, don't they? It can't be purchased. It won't happen by chasing worldly pleasures. Our, our country, our culture is out of control in chasing pleasure. Things that God has said are out of bounds. Things that God has said dishonor him. Our country seems to be chasing uh, at an ever-increasing fervor. And uh, what happens is the pleasure may be that they're chasing may give them some temporary pleasure, but then it comes with some chains, doesn't it? And the more you try to uh, find pleasure in those things that God says are hurting you and, and are not good for you, the greater the weight of the chains that come onto our lives. You can't find peace in ch chasing a pleasure. Uh, you, you're going to need another greater high down the road. It cannot satisfy. 
Some people try to drown their sorrows, don't they, in alcohol and drugs and those kinds of things. But when you try to drown your sorrows, uh, like I discovered as a teenager, when I tried to do that in my life, uh, I discovered that sorrows can swim, can't they? Uh, and they have buddies. They multiply. Uh, you can't, you can't uh, chase worldly pleasures and have the peace that the Bible uh, is describing. it. You can't even find this kind of peace in another person. You can't. It's unreasonable to expect that another person is going to be responsible for your peace. Uh, my wife and I celebrated 25 years of marriage this past July 1st. I love her more now than I ever have. We have a wonderful relationship by the grace of God. But she can't bring me my peace. Only Jesus can. Listen, even the best of relationships will let you down sometime. And if we put another person on a pedestal, there's only one way for them to step. Off. So don't put people up there. The only one that deserves a throne is Jesus. And he's the only one that can provide us the kind of peace that the Bible is talking about. Peace that lasts. Now, uh, this peace that Jesus provides for us uh, is not a, uh, if you give him your life, uh, you won't ever have another problem, uh, happily ever after fairy tale. It's not that kind of peace, but it is the kind of peace that when you have it, it will give your heart and life an undeniable, settled contentment. I think that's a good definition of Christian peace. A settled contentment. I have discovered in Jesus all I will ever need to be satisfied in this life and in the one to come. When we start thinking like that, when we get to that place in our Christian walk, we can know that we are experiencing his peace, a settled contentment. Jesus is enough. Is he enough for you? Do you experience the peace of Christ? In your life? If, you, if you're not, there's good news for you. If you don't know him, there's good news for you. You can know Jesus in a personal way. See, our world has this wrong. They think if you just get a little bit of religion, that you'll be right with God. But I believe this religion is going to send more people to hell than anything else on planet Earth. God's not interested in religion. God wants to have a personal relationship with you and me through His Son, Jesus Christ. And when we have that relationship, then we can know His peace. I think that's what Jesus meant when He said in John 16, 33, I have told you these things so that in, you, you, so that in me you may have peace. In this world, you will have trouble, but take heart. I have overcome the world. There's not a problem one that you, that you and I go through that Jesus doesn't know about and helps carry us through. We just have to trust him. Now, I struggle with that, I have to admit still. I still want to squirm out of his hands sometimes. I still want to take control. Lord, I, 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 I love you, I trust you, but I think I'll jump in and fix this one. And when I start doing that, I mess it up every time. Anybody else there with me on that one? Jesus promised his peace even in the midst of the storms of life. And they will come, won't they? No one's immune from the storms of life of life, but even then we can know his peace. I had the privilege of serving in the United States Army back in the middle 1980s. I went to basic training, in fact, at Fort Knox here in Kentucky. I was a Michigan boy, and that was my first exposure to Kentucky. I didn't know that there were nice people in Kentucky. I thought they all wore brown rimmed hats and they were mean. I found out since there's some really nice people in Kentucky, but I went through basic training there and my, my AIT, my advanced individual training at Fort Knox, uh, and then I got the word that I was going to Germany. And I thought, I didn't sign up for Germany. When I met with the recruiter, he said, where's the top three places you'd like to go? I said, Hawaii, Colorado, and I don't remember what the third place was. 
But I guarantee it wasn't Germany. They shipped me over to Germany. Uh, but while I was there, I met a missionary couple, Brad and Debbie Elgin, who ran a thing called the Hospitality House just off, off of our post there in Schweinfurt. It was West Germany still then. There was still a wall back then. Uh, and they began to pour into my life. I had no idea. Uh, I was already saved. I was already called into ministry. I went in the army to get money to go to school for two years. I had no idea that God was going to use that time like none other in my life to prepare me for ministry. And God used that sweet couple to, to help me. Well, I was sitting in chapel one day on, bar- on post at, at there at our barracks, and Brad came to me and he, he, he said, Andy, uh, you need to come back to the house with us. You need to call home. And so I went back to the hospitality house and I called my mom. and She said, Andy, you need to come home. Your oldest brother, Mike, has been killed in a car wreck. And so, uh, and many of you have been through that and worse, I know. Uh, but, you, but you know the pain of, of losing someone uh, that, that you love and that you're close to. My brother and his wife and three young daughters lived in West Virginia. So I flew that, that long flight uh, across the big pond uh, to, into West Virginia and spent time just trying to comfort my, my sister-in-law and those precious girls and our, our family. And, uh, and so we buried our brother on a Tuesday morning. And that night, my sister, who was younger than me, my, my only sister, she had an aneurysm break in her head. And she died a week and a day later after my brother. Uh, and she had three little precious children. Uh, now, again, I know some of you have been through things that if, if we were to hear, we would, we would just be melting with you as well. Uh, and, and I got to tell you that uh, a few weeks later, when I got back on a plane to go back to Germany, uh, that was one of the hardest, loneliest, challenging flights I've ever been on in my life. But even in the middle of all of that, I still had his peace. I knew that Jesus was with me. And I had peace. Do you know that kind of peace in your life? Do you know, do you have a peace that if your life were to end uh, today, God forbid, but if your life were to end today, do you know for certain where you would spend eternity? I gave my heart and life to Jesus when I was 18 years old. I think I shared my story with you the last time I was here. That's when my eternity got settled when I was 18 years old and I prayed to receive Christ into my life and He changed my forever. Have you had that moment, that place where you've given your heart and life to Jesus and you have complete peace about where you'll spend eternity when you lay this life down. Now, I'm hoping he gives me several more years. I'm hoping those boys will get married and get busy. I wanted some grandchildren. I'm looking forward to that, Lord willing. But, but I have peace, I know, because of him, not because of me, because his promises are true, because he's faithful, because everything he ever promised us will come to pass, just like he said it will. Do you have peace in your heart about your eternity? I think that's why Paul could write in Philippians chapter 4, beginning at verse 6, do not be anxious about anything. Any worriers out there? Do not be anxious about anything. Okay, well, what's the remedy, Paul? But in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your requests to God. Okay, well, what's the promise? Verse 7. If, you, if we'll do that, then the, here's the promise. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Peace will stand guard over your heart and mind in Christ Jesus as you seek Him and seek His face and walk with Him in fellowship. The peace that's ours in Jesus transcends human understanding. In other words, we may be going through one of the hardest times in our lives and still have His peace. 
It's the kind of peace that when others look at our lives who don't know the Lord and look at the things that maybe we're going through and we're able to say to them, even though this is hard, I really wouldn't have asked for this if I had a a choice in the matter. I still love Jesus. He still loves me. I still have His peace. When they look at our lives and they see us with that kind of attitude, they're going, how is this possible? And we're able to say, it's because of Jesus. (laughs) It's only because of Jesus I'm experiencing His peace right now because God Himself has put it in my heart. Everything circumstantially should say, you should have a lack of peace right now. But I still have it. Why? Because it transcends human understanding. It can only be explained as coming from the hand of God. Do you know that kind of peace in your life this morning? Now, I think uh, that when I ask that question, Is it possible, is it even possible in our day to have peace? Uh, I would say a resounding yes. Yes, based upon the truth of God's word and my own experience uh, with the living God and being in a personal relationship with his son Jesus by the power of his Holy Spirit, I can say yes, without doubt. But here's some practical things that I hope will help us as we think about having peace during this Christmas season and beyond. One thing that we have to do is lay down our worldly expectations for the holidays and trust in Jesus. The the writer of Proverbs said, trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge Him and He will make your path straight. Don't trust in the world. Don't trust even in our own ability to try to make this Christian thing work. Trust in Jesus. And when we do, our families may still be messed up, but we can have peace. And when we trust in Him, the world will still be filled with all kinds of uncertainties, but we can still have peace. In we, when we trust in Jesus, uh, we may not have the feelings that others say we should be feeling this time of year, but we can still have His peace. Peace resides in the person of Jesus Christ. And if you have him, you have his peace. Now, uh, the angels were told uh, that there was a baby in Bethlehem uh, and that he was the Messiah. And uh, when they heard that word from the Lord, uh, here's what they said. They responded to what they heard uh, from the angel who was then joined by this choir, right, that says glory to God. They're singing glory to God in the highest and on earth. Peace on men and women on whom his favor rests. When they declared that, here's what the... Here's what the uh, Shepherd said, let's go to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has told us about. They heard the message and they acted on the message. There was an obedience there. Can you imagine if the shepherds had seen the angel and then the choir and then the angel and the choir go back up into heaven and they look at each other? Man, I've never seen anything like that. Have you? No, I haven't seen anything like that before. Okay, well, let's go back and tend the sheep. Are you kidding me? And that wasn't their response at all. We've got to go see what uh, the angels have told us. And they went and found Jesus. They went and found him. And I think uh, that as we wrap this up, I think uh, that the Bible is calling you and I to pursue peace. Peace is personal. Peace is only found in the person of Jesus Christ. And we have to pursue peace. We have to practice peace, if you will. Uh, We have to uh, spend time in worship together corporately. And then uh, in our own prayer closet, we need to meet with the Lord and worship Him there. Now, I'm not saying it has to be a physical closet. I'm saying that I would say to you, set apart a place somewhere in your life where you know that that's the place where I regularly meet with my Lord and worship Him and pray to Him and read His Word. Uh, We have to pursue peace. The price of uh, spiritual freedom is eternal vigilance. 
And the only way we can stand on guard is to continue to, to be people who are worshiping, praying, seeking the Lord, reading his word trying to memorize the word, trying to take every thought captive. These thoughts will come into our head. And by the way, not all of them are from God. We're supposed to take them captive in obedience to Christ. And the ones that are from God, we let into our hearts. And the ones that aren't, by the power of the Spirit, we get rid of them. (laughs) We're supposed to do those kinds of things, to practice peace, to pursue peace. I think there's some words that are closely related to the word peace. I think of the word repentance. That if you don't know Jesus here this morning, you need to repent and trust in Him. That means to turn from your your own way, to turn from your sinful ways, and to turn to Jesus in repentance. That means it's a, a godly sorrow for our sin and a turning away from it to the living God. Repentance is bound up in the word peace. Forgiveness is bound up in the word peace. We can't have his peace until we've experienced his forgiveness. And when you receive Jesus into your heart and life, he washes your sin stain away. He forgives you past, present, and future. He'll never hold your sin against you again. He throws it as far as the east is from the west, and he remembers it no more. The sweet aroma of a forgiven Christian. It's bound up in peace. And oh, by the way, we need to forgive others. If we're going to be able to pursue peace, if it's going to be a part of who we are as Christians, we've got to forgive other people. And for some of you, I, I, I don't know you, but I know enough to know this. For some of you, there's a name that just came to mind or a face that just came to mind for you. And you're, and you're saying, do I need to forgive that person? God, are you leading me to forgive that person? Don't you know what they did? And God says, yes, I do. And yes, I am. I'm telling you to forgive them. Just like I forgave you through my son on the cross. There's our motivation. Jesus hanging on a cross for you and for me. That's our motivation. Well, they've never asked for forgiveness. Okay, uh, you can still forgive them. Forgiveness is unilateral. You can choose to forgive somebody without them even wanting to be forgiven or thinking they need to be forgiven. Reconciliation takes two. And we pray for that, but we can forgive. And so if we're going to experience this peace, we've got to forgive. And then there's the word grace. You can't really talk about peace without talking about grace. And I want you to imagine that you have an 8.5 by 11 blank sheet of paper and you fold it in half and then you open it. And on the left-hand side is the word grace in big letters. And then in the middle is the greater than sign. You know what I'm talking about? A sideways V with the greater than part pointing back towards grace. Greater than. And then I want you to imagine writing whatever it is you need to write on the right hand blank side of the page. Every time you've ever felt rejected, the greatest shame, failure, fear, concern, wound, hurt, writing all of those things down on this side of the paper. And know that grace is greater still. You cannot out the grace of God. And when you know his grace, his unmerited favor, you'll know his peace. Those words are bound up into each other. And then there's joy, finally, joy. See, a lot of people get confused here too, I think. They think that, 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 that we're supposed to be happy all of the time. Well, I like being happy. Happy is a good thing. But happiness depends on positive happenings. And life's not always filled with those positive happenings, is it? But joy depends on Jesus alone. And we can have joy even when we're not experiencing positive happenings. Joy. Joy and peace are bound up together. In the busyness of a holiday season, Don't miss Jesus. And don't miss his peace. Let's pray together. Gracious Heavenly Father, thank you uh, that you have seen fit to meet with your people just like you promised you would, God. But in this place, you meet with us in a powerful and special and unique way, Lord, as we gather as the body of Christ. And we thank you that because of Jesus 
and him alone, uh, we can know your peace. And I pray, Lord, if there's anyone here uh, that does not know your son, uh, has not uh, experienced your peace uh, through the power of your Holy Spirit by being saved, we pray this morning that that person right now would cry out to Jesus, Lord, that they would forsake everything else that maybe they've depended upon to think that they were a good person and they could be right with you, to, to, to just cast that aside as rubbish and to repent and to trust in Jesus who alone can save and provide real and lasting peace. And God, I pray for my brothers and sisters that are here today. Lord, thank you for allowing us to take uh, this uh, Lord's Supper here today. And remind us, God, again, that your grace is greater still uh, and that your joy is ours because of Jesus and that in him we can have peace even though the world may be in turmoil, even though our world may be in turmoil, we can still know your peace. And I pray it in Jesus' name. Amen.